So I'm going to take you now back from the lab into the wild and we're going to talk about how these traits may have evolved in natural populations of beach mice. So to do this, this involves us actually going back to the field. So here's a picture of me and my postdoc, um, Vera Dominguez, when we're out on the Atlantic coast um, catching mice. Um, here's a mouse uh, currently being weighed, so we hang it by its tail on a little pistola. We take measurements, including their weight, um, the size of their ears and feet, um, etc. And what Vera's doing here is measuring uh, their coat color. And what's nice about um, this work in the wild is we take these measurements, we measure their coat color, we also give them a little ear tag, and we take a little snippet of DNA from their tail, and then we release them back in the wild. So here we have a DNA sample from each of these mice, and we have a record of their coloration. So next what I'd like to do is tell you about what we've learned about natural populations of these mice and how these color differences may have evolved. So just by way of reminder, um, so far, what I've done is I've focused on only one of these populations, that is population number three, the Santa Rosa Island beach mouse. But next, what I'd like to do is tell you about variation among these subspecies, so the five subspecies on the Gulf Coast and the three um, subspecies on the Atlantic Coast. So um, when we go out and catch these mice and record their color differences, um, we find some very striking patterns, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. So here what I'm showing you are um, cartoons that represent um, the different subspecies of beach mice. Um, so each one of these cartoons shows you the typical color of a beach mouse from each of these populations compared here to um, a mainland mouse. So the first thing you may notice is that um, all the beach mice um, are much lighter in color compared to the mainland mouse, but that each of these subspecies differs in their color pattern. And in fact, they're so distinct that if you went, let's say, for spring break down to the Gulf Coast of Florida, and you brought me back a beach mouse, I would say with about 95% certainty, just by looking at the color of the beach mouse, I could tell you what subspecies it is. But instead, if you went to Florida and you didn't tell me if you went to the Atlantic coast or the Gulf coast and you just brought me about back a beach mouse, I'd probably have a 50-50 chance of knowing what subspecies it was. And that's because the mice on the Atlantic coast are very similar to mice on the Gulf coast. So let me highlight that here. So, for example, these two subspecies, even though they're separated by over 300 kilometers, um, are very simi similar in their overall color pattern, and in fact, I can't tell them apart. Likewise, these mice are very similar, and these mice are very similar. So what this suggests is that um, on the Atlantic coast and Gulf coast, um, the mice have uh, convergently, uh, convergent color patterns. And so what we wanted to do first was ask the question of, um, did these mice evolve these similar color differences independently? And if so, did they use the same genes? So the first thing I want to show you is a, um, a tree or a topology that shows you the relationships among these different subspecies. So this is a simplified version of a tree that we generated using molecular data, but it highlights um, the relationships among these subspecies within uh, Paramiscus polyonotus. And what you can see is the Gulf Coast beach mice uh, shown here, all five of those subspecies cluster together. They're very closely related. But they're actually not that closely related to Atlantic Coast beach mice um, shown here. In other words, it looks like light coloration has evolved independently on two coasts. So the Gulf Coast beach mice probably arose from a dark colored ancestor sometime in the past that was probably from the panhandle of Florida. Whereas the Atlantic Coast beach mice independently evolved light coloration, pro probably from an ancestor in central Florida that was dark in color. Okay, but here's the cool part. Now that we know, at least in one of these Gulf Coast subspecies, that the melanocortin-1 receptor is involved, we can ask, in these independently evolved light-colored beach mice on the Atlantic Coast, is that same gene and same mutation involved? So to do this, um, we return back to this melanocortin-1 gene, and we sequence the DNA in the mice that we collected on the Atlantic coast and ask, do we find that same arginine to cysteine uh, change at position 65? So we simply genotype that one particular site um, and ask, is it present in the Atlantic coast? Now, despite the fact that mice from the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic coast are so similar in coat color, um, let me just say we never found that cysteine change in any of the mice from the Atlantic coast. So what that tells us is that the same mutation isn't involved in that convergently evolved light coloration on the Atlantic coast. 
So you may be thinking, well, it's not the same mutation, but maybe it's a new mutation. Remember, there are lots of mutations in MC1R that can cause color differences. I told you this earlier. So maybe a new mutation in MC1R is causing light coloration on the Atlantic coast. So it may not be the same mutation, but it could be the same gene. So we went back to the Atlantic coast mice and sequenced the entire melanocortin-1 receptor um, and asked, are there any new mutations that are correlated with color? Well, in fact, we found four new mutations in the melanocortin-1 receptor but none of them were perfectly correlated with color. And when we did those pharma pharmacological assays, like the ones I showed you earlier, um, none of them had an effect on the uh, activity of MC1R. So what this tells us is that it's not just, it's not the same mutation, it's also not the same gene that's responsible for the convergent evolution um, of light coloration on the, in the Atlantic coast mice. Now this is the case for a melanocortin-1 receptor, but we're still checking this gene, uh, or checking these populations for changes in agouti and corin.